All right, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Product. So tonight, we're super lucky. I have Brandon Quinn with us tonight. He's a senior product manager. Um, Brandon, welcome to the show, man. Yo, Brandon, thanks for having me, man. Of course, well, welcome. I'm super happy to have you here. Um, do you want to do a quick introduction for yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Brandon Quinn, like you said, uh, senior product manager at LinkedIn. I've been at the company for about a year now. Previously, I was at a startup uh, that was backed by Y Combinator. And prior to that, I spent about seven to eight years working at Apple. Just got my, my, my experience started off in the call center and like worked my way into a senior role that took me actually out to China, uh, working for Apple for, for three years. Nice. That's awesome, man. So um, I don't know what the resources were like for you when you were getting into product management, but for me, it was always tough to find well, really, what is product management? I could never find a definition. I, I heard from uh, founders and CEOs that, what, about the field and how, how some of the functions, but there's never a, a definition for it. How would you define product management? It's a good question. I think, um, I think about product management. I, think, I tend to think directly on the experience that you're building for someone. And that experience transpires between different mediums. It could be software only, it could be hardware and software, or it could be hardware only. And so I tend to think about the product experience or the product development process of building that experience that you're going to be giving over to someone, whether it's a, a business or a consumer, um, whatever that is, it's like the, the process in building that, that product that's going to have an experience in someone else with someone else. Nice. And then you just had a, a webinar that I checked out with Product School where you talked about this idea around, um, I hope I don't butcher it, Ikigai. Ikigai, um, yeah. Ikigai, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk so about Ikigai, Ikigai is, that? yeah, Ikigai is like something uh, I, I stumbled on. Um, you know, I try to like, you know, I, I, many product managers just trying to research and learn about um, all sorts of different things. And one of the things I, I discovered was, um, Ikigai, and it's a Japanese philosophy, and, and it's evolved in the U.S., as many things do, and it's really about trying to identify your, uh, your skills and, like, your, your, your professional skills and aligning that with things that make you feel fulfilled. So um, I, I, I can use an example with LinkedIn. So, I'm, you know, I have a skill in product management, um, and I have a passion for helping people out and, and trying to help get people that look like me, um, you know, underrepresented groups, opportunity and career, uh, career opportunities. And, you know, with, with my product management and my passion, I working at LinkedIn, I feel really fulfilled in what we're doing, what we're building. Um, it's really tied into my personal mission. And every day I kind of get to wake up and feel like I'm fulfilling something that is bigger than, than me, you know, and it keeps me pretty motivated, keeps me, you know, driven, I guess you can say. Nice. Nice. And then you, uh, you mentioned earlier that you started in the call center um, and worked your way into product. So what was your part, journey into product management like? And maybe lay it out. And um, I just know that we come from very diverse backgrounds and uh, I haven't seen two product managers with the same journey. Um, so I'd love to hear about yours. Yeah. You know, and, and I think um, from my experience, it's, very unorthodox. Um, and, and that's what I love about it. Um, I started off in the call center, you know, trying to sell Apple products. And, and this is way before, I'm not going to date myself here, but this is way before uh, Apple was as popular as it is now. And we used to have to really work to try to sell products. And so um, as I was like typing in the CRM notes after a call, some, some uh, people came up to me and started interviewing me. And they're asking me questions and I wasn't sure what's going on. I was like, am I getting fired or what? But they're asking me questions, how I use the software and, and, and how it works and how to improve the CRM. At the end of their questionnaire, I just paused and I asked what they did. And, um, you know, they told me about their industry. They told me that they came from Austin to try to figure out how to build the, the, the CRM system to be better and make us more efficient. And at the end of that, I said to myself, that's the job I want. And that's, that's, that's how I identified that I wanted to be in product management. I like the idea of traveling, I like the idea of speaking to people in like a low pressure environment, understanding their pain points. I like the idea of being able to translate those into something that's tangible and helping people build software. And so I started the process of, of like slowly getting into product management. I did that through um, project management. My first step was, was getting um, certified through the 
um, Project Management Institute with the um, a PMP. So that 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 was my door in, and um, I you know I just kept working on it and learning more. Um, Anderson and Horitz, uh, um, they've been huge. Like I, I love Ben Horitz, and like all of his books have been uh, super important to me. Uh, his blogs have helped me uh, learned a lot. I think he has a, a, a very famous blog, the Good PM, Bad PM, uh, that I subscribe to. So, yeah, that, that was my process. Nice. Um, so, let me ask you this: Do you think that your call center experience helps you as a PM? Oh yeah, most definitely. I think the most important part of being in the call center is like you're speaking to people who are going to use Apple products. Yeah. And um, I think. You know, to work in a call center, it's a high pressure environment. Uh, you're you're already like, you're taking a lot of calls. You're speaking to people. You're trying to convince people to buy something you believe in. And so, um, being a salesperson for a product that I believed in was easy for me to transition into other roles at Apple because I had this passion for uh, the company. I had this passion for the industry, and um, you know, a lot of what product management is is like translating. Uh, what you want to build into what is the customer value, right? What What is going to be the return of investment of building whatever X is? And I think um, that's a bit of what sales is too, right? It's, it's a bit of like explaining value to people, what what they're going to gain out of this and sharing that passion that you, of, of how you believe in something. Yeah. And then you also have like startup experience as well. So maybe compare and contrast the like working for like an Apple or like a LinkedIn with the startup and like, how do I know if I'm interested in growing as a product manager or entering product management, how do I kind of determine what environment might be optimal for me? Right. I think um, there's, there's many companies that you can join, right? I think there's opportunities in uh, small companies where you get like a full stack experience, I guess you can call it where you're going to be seeing all different parts, which are like, how do I grow this business? Um, to what's the core experience that we're trying to have someone uh, work with to also like down funnel data driven um, offline batch analytics type work. At a big company, you're going to definitely have more of a, a smaller focus. It's going to be very uh, narrowed down into to one particular type of experience. And so um, you're going to grow in your knowledge base of that experience that you're focused on. So say like if you're working at Facebook, working on feed or LinkedIn, working on the news feed, right? You're going to be really focused on like how do you build recommendation models and what people are seeing in their feed versus uh, being a startup and just seeing like all the different types of angles, but you not, might not go very deep because you don't have the volume of data that's happening at like a company such as LinkedIn or Facebook. Yeah, no, no, that, that totally makes sense. Um, what advice would you have for a new or aspiring product manager? Yeah, I think the the number one thing is to always be learning. And <clears throat> I know it's difficult to probably uh, get access to, you know, product school or something that you have to pay for. But podcasts like this, listening to other PMs talk about their journey, um, blogs, uh, any learning platform that's free, LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, um, Coursera, anything that you can get your hands on, uh, just listen and learn. And then I think the other thing that's um, kind of looked over is, you know, you're, you're doing this, like right? you're, you're building, um, you know, in public. And I think there's a bit of like a product manager who is always just scrappy and like, they're going to figure out how to build something. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not strange to go off and, and start a side hustle, right? Like start a blog and try to see if you can get people to sign up or start a podcast or, or do something that that can help grow a user base in um, some type of experience. So I think um, anyone can build. And if you want to be a product manager, you can try to build something, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's where, you know, it kind of happened. It just happened on accident. But I ended up, my work at the nonprofit um, provided me with opportunities to build, right? And I think a lot of people, um, aspiring PMs or people that are aspiring just to get in any type of position, forget that. You have one, you have transferable skills, but at the, on the same time, you have to show that hiring manager that your score, your, how your skills actually transfer, like, right. like what projects have you worked on? And if you, there is no shortage of projects for nonprofits. I mean, it'd be super yeah. easy. A lot of leaders on LinkedIn as well, 
where you could just Google a search from grassroots nonprofits, help them build their mailing list, build their website, right. build out yeah. an inventory, build something, document I, I think it. That's great. Yeah. And like, like the nonprofit route is, is, is you, you nailed it with that. And um, there's so many uh, pre technology tools out there that you can, you know, help them use that they may not be aware to, right? Like a lot of nonprofits are into the weeds of technical, uh, the, the technical scope that they, they need. And so, um, you know, I, I personally help nonprofits myself. I, I work with a group out here, Project Avery, and just like little things that they need, getting on the phone and talking through the, the um, manager through how to help them out is, is useful for them. But also like if I was an aspiring PM, there's like a ton of opportunity that they can enhance, right? And Absolutely. just build. Like, I think the other part that you nailed on that was um, the applied knowledge piece, right? There, there's there's podcasts and books and courses that you can take, but nothing's going to be applying your knowledge and having something tangible that you can show. Yeah, you know, um, funny. So here, my story into web design is, my nonprofit needed some updates on their website. And I never forget, I, they asked me, I sent them the email, I said, sorry, I don't know how to do this. And I was like, I, crap, I left, the, I left, let the nonprofit down, let my friends down. And, and then I just spent the next month learning how to do it. And then I executed on it. And then now I, I build websites freelance and do one a month and make pretty good money. So um, right. that opened door, that gave me projects to work on it give me a place to serve uh, a great cause to serve and like you said there's tons of free tools canva has free nonprofit tools google cloud you could if, if you're interested anybody listening if you're interested in google well guess what you go to a nonprofit and mi migrate their data to google cloud it's free and you can be the admin for them and just migrate it um right. let's see here mailchimp you could help build an email list right for free. So there's so many different outlets. And do some design work. You know, there's there's yeah. just so much opportunity out there. And even like when you think about opportunities for nonprofits and, and trying to figure out just picking up the phone and, and volunteering and asking what are the, some of their pain points, right? Like if it's operational, like if it's the like food banks are, are struggling right now on operational needs and like, you know, how do you help them set up like an event right to schedule um, people volunteering or maybe it's, it's a mail list and helping them with MailChimp or it's also like at the SEO a aspect of it. Like there's a lot of new nonprofits that are starting people who want to help and figuring out how can you help nonprofits become more discoverable, right? And implementing some some blog posts or some relevance rankings to help their, their pages on Google. Absolutely. Um, so you talk about always learning. What do you use today? What, how do you learn? Where are you learning? So, you know, I'm biased. <laughs> I spend a yeah. lot of time on LinkedIn learning. Uh, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, which is... Uh, linkedin.com slash in slash BB Quinn, B as in boy, B as in Victor. You'll see, like I have a ton of LinkedIn courses that are on my profile. Um, I, I encourage anyone who uh, who has a computer just to, to even get on YouTube and product school has a ton of free webinar stuff um, that they're putting on LinkedIn, but also they're putting it on, um, on YouTube. So consume the free stuff. And if you can, if you have the, the, the means to actually pay for something, I would, I would do like a masterclass to um, LinkedIn Learning or Coursera or Udemy. Um, all, all have good content on there. Yeah. And you have, like I said earlier, you have a great webinar that you did with Product School that I'll make sure to plug in the comments um, for anybody that, that just Thank keeps you. looking for a starting point um, into product management. Um, what books, do you have any favorite books that you, that you recommend? Yeah, you know, um, I mentioned Ben Horowitz. I think, uh, you know, the hard thing about hard things is he elements uh, rap into the into the pod or into his book. He, he starts every chapter with a rap lyric that coincides into uh, starting a business. It's very entrepreneurial. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, Ikigai. I have a book on Ikigai that I highly recommend. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, any books on uh, business in general versus like not narrowed into product, I tend to be uh, very keen to. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, sneakerheads, you and I are both sneakerheads. Uh, we're probably a huge fan of uh, the, the shoe dog book, right? Phil Knight, uh, his, his whole story is like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I have that. I have that right over here somewhere. Um, no. And I, I love that you talk about the business books because I think when, when people, Think about getting into tech or think about getting into product management they're looking for a book on product but really as a product manager you would 
do yourself a, a huge favor if you would read How to Win Friends and Influence People or a right. leadership book or a book on management um, because it's, 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 you're more so dealing with people than, right. than products. <laughs> Yeah, and you know that that that's um, anyone who's coming from a non-technical background, you know. In 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 my product school webinar, I mentioned the idea of like these different bubbles. Like, yeah. PM's definitely got to have some type of technical expertise and desire yeah. to learn about the technical side, some design and understand like how to build a good user experience. But if you're not technical and not uh, for a designer, where you can really excel and where the information is out there for you to consume and become that is leadership. And I, I really believe, you know, the, the best type of PMs are going to be ones who have the leadership qualities, you know, are able to corral folks, you know, always lead as a, as a servant. You mentioned this, like being um, of service to your team is going to get you a long way of always thinking, like, how can I help the team first? And being communicative about that will get you a long way with someone who is very technical as an engineer and you're, you're up front saying, hey, like, I'm not, a, I was never an engineer. I don't know much about the technical space, but, um, you know, how can I help you be better at your job? Right. Or how can I help you and, or enable you to do your job better? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, now that you say that, I think it's really easy as a, as a new PM, especially to get caught up in like the product cycle and just focusing on velocity and going from, from one sprint to another where, you know, you got to take a minute and celebrate some wins and talk to your team and get to know them and find out what roadblocks, not blockers for your ticket, but what roadblocks like communication wise and what can you solve? And it is that human connection and product. If you bring that human connection and leadership over, you know, I think it'll help you be successful. Exactly. Exactly. And I think at the end of the day, again, you're, you know, based on my philosophy of product, right? You're building something for someone to interact with. Yeah. And the human element is going to be important. And you want it to live in the product from the way that you build it, you know, the way that you have your standups, the way that you have your product planning, your sprint planning, retros, to the way that you release. There's always like this hum human element to it because you're building something for, for a human to interact with, right? You have the empathy, have the compassion, have the, the, the feelings put into the product so people experience it and they can really feel that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, was there anything I missed? Any any questions I didn't ask? Anything you want to add, or maybe any gems that you want to share before we hop off? Uh, no, I think you 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 nailed it. I think the one thing that I always leave with, in in like you know, it's a tagline tagline on my LinkedIn profile is just this is a, a, a empathy driven industry, and the the people who are really successful at it have a ton of empathy, and so. Um, I don't think any realists don't have empathy. I think they they uh, just continue need to grow on it and tap into it and make sure that they're they're uh, paying attention to that. Nice, I love that. And then, how can people get a hold of you if they want to follow up on this episode, or connect with you? Yeah, so <clears throat> I try to take on a few people to mentor every every now and then. I have a, a cohort right now that I'm working with, and I'm I'm, I'm really focused on helping people find opportunities, resume reviews, um, you know, interview coaching. Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, my name is Brandon Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N. -N. Uh, you can find it at linkedin.com slash N slash B as in boy, B as in Victor, Q-U-I-N-N. -N. Uh, send me a message there. Uh, connect first. If you if you don't have LinkedIn premium, make sure you connect first so it's a free message. Don't waste the message. Uh, um, uh, not connected to me, so. Nice. Well, man, it was great talking to you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Awesome. Uh, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, likewise.